Thank you very much, uh, Rosie. Um, I've been doing the beginnings of sort of book tours and stuff, and the question that most is most often asked is history, yeah, fine, but is it more than just uh, decoration, entertainment? Do you ever learn anything from history? Do people learn anything from history? Has it a purpose? Um, and I thought I'd talk a little bit about that tonight. Um, let's start in about 1928, early 1929, in the United States, there is a consumer boom going on. There's lots and lots of new goods out there. Um, ba fantastically uh, exciting ready-made clothes, um, kitchenware, um, cars, motorbikes. And this consumer boom uh, produces a financial boom. And it produces uh, a new financial world in which there are lots of exciting new organizations called investment trusts working together. And there is an asset boom at the same time. House prices start to rise more and more. People get more and more indebted. You have a fellow called Ponzi down in Florida selling off little strips of land, some of them underneath the water, in fact, to build houses on, hence the Ponzi scheme. And asset prices, share prices grow and grow and grow and grow and grow. And it becomes, it starts to look worryingly like a classic bubble. John Maynard Keynes, the great economist, was also, by the way, an investment manager, he, he, a full -time, semi full time investment manager. And he went over in uh, early 1929 and he sniffed around and he realized he didn't like the smell of it. Um, and he took all his money out of the American stock market by the sort of spring of 1929. And the stock market carried on rising and rising and rising. And delightfully, given his wonderful reputation, Keynes panicked and put all the money back in again <laughs> just as it crashed. Now, my point is that um, economists with a sense of history, um, and there are some, were hitting the alarm bells quite hard um, during the last boom, which in many ways was very like that one. There was a, uh, the lots and lots of new products, in our case, iPhones and so on, um, pouring out. There was all sorts of exciting new financial instruments and financial institutions, not um, little groups of investment trusts working together, of course, but hedge funds and, and so on. Um, and there was the classic um, asset price bubble. And the fact that so few Washington policymakers had an acute sense of history, they thought that somehow um, the laws of bubbles, um, uh, financial bubbles, had been suspended for all time. Um, was a really, really serious mistake. Had they had a stronger sense of history, I think they wouldn't have made it. And there are plenty of professors out there and other people who are writing who did have a sense of history and spotted what was coming, only sadly not the people at the top. Um, I think a sense of history um, is utterly essential to being a civilized person. I think if you don't know anything about what was going on in China uh, at the time that we were building the cathedrals here or um, anything about why Russia is the shape and size Russia is. It's a bit like um, having a very detailed knowledge of Notting Hill streets, but no idea about where Britain is in relation to the rest of the world. I mean, you're just not properly educated. And the, the series I've been doing is, is partly designed to help people, give people a sort of route map um, to get them going. It seems to me that uh, one of the things that we learn from history is that it is perfectly possible um, for societies at times of crisis not to panic. Um, I started by talking about asset bubbles because that's an obvious um, thing that you can look back at history and you can learn about how these develop and how they end. The first one, of course, was the great tulip uh, asset bubble um, in, in uh, Holland when at one point so great was the madness um, that people were exchanging a little handful of wizened tulip bulbs for the equivalent price of a very large handsome house um, in the middle of Amsterdam or a fully equipped merchant ship. Um, the bubble burst, a horrendous moment. The rest of Europe laughed at the Dutch 
because the Dutch were notorious gamblers. It was said that Dutch soldiers would even take bets on the outcome of a battle that they were fighting at the time. Um, they, were, they were a sort of gambling-obsessed nation. So the rest of Europe roared with laughter. But the actual lesson is that the Dutch decided that all this huge web of vast contracts, you know, I owe Rosie 10 zillion guilders and she wrote, owes Henry Porter, you know, and, and on it goes. They would simply cancel the lot. Um, and it was done at state and city level rather than in, the, in terms of the national government, but there was a general Dutch conversation. Uh, they were all, as it were, hung over, and they sat down back in the taverns, and they said, you know what, let's pretend none of this happened. Let's just cancel all of this. Um, and remarkably, it worked. They didn't lose their heads. They had a good old-fashioned Dutch conversation, and within a few years, they were as prosperous as ever. So not all the lessons of history uh, are bad ones, but it seems to me um, that there are two kinds of history lessons that are particularly important. Um, more general history lessons. Um, one is that the most dangerous thing in, in world politics or public affairs tends to be groupthink. There are so many examples. Um, we were talking a bit about um, child abuse and Jimmy Savile before I came on, where something is going on and somehow nobody sees it. Um, or the example of um, free trade at the moment, where everybody in America, uh, on each side of the political spectrum during the presidential race, is saying free trade, uh, more free trade, the better. It's absolutely fantastic, incredibly important for the world. America has always been in favor of free trade. Now these rotten Chinese are sort of uh, not playing by the proper rules. In fact, of course, um, America built its entire industrial economy, as some of you may have heard start the week this morning, on tariff protectionism and walls and stole engineers and stole designers from, from, from this country to the point where um, it became a capital offense um, if you were uh, a skilled craftsman to leave Britain to go to America, so worried were the British about the Americans snaffling their technology and putting up tariff walls. Um, we have a conversation going on in America um, that has very, very little sense of history. America is in deep, deep trouble economically, has to take some huge national decisions and, uh, and turn uh, the direction of their economy and of their politics. And only if they have a, a better developed sense of history are they going to have any chance of doing it. Because to most people, the group think is uh, free trade. The group think says you can't possibly change direction. History shows that societies can change direction, um, don't have to go with the groupthink. The groupthink of the early 1600s, uh, late 1500s, early 1600s was the new mercantilism and the expansion across the oceans with these wonderful ocean-going boats. Um, and in Japan, they were seeing um, the Dutch and the Portuguese and then um, the British sailors coming in, and they had the option of going out around the world as well. Uh, Japan, uh, using a British um, uh, engineer and sailor, uh, built two absolutely perfect replicas of European galleons in about 1600. They could have gone out and, and started to, to build colonies in, in Africa and around the rest of Asia had they chosen to do so. They had lots of problems at home. They had rising social disturbance. And like a lot of countries, they had deforested. They had got rid of most of their forests for fuel and building, and they were in a terrible state. And the obvious thing was to do what the British were doing, which was to explode out around the world. And fascinatingly, the Japanese totally rejected that groupthink. And they decided instead that they were going to close and turn in and reject the rest of the world. Um, and they, they went so far as to make it a law that every single major Japanese ship had to have a hole um, carved in its hull at the back, in its stern, I should say, so that if they went out to sea um, beyond a certain level of waves, they would sink. Um, and it, uh, and le leaving, tr trying to leave Japan was a capital offense. Um, they had guns, and they decided that they were too violent and also um, rather um, unaristocratic, and so they gathered them in and destroyed them. And they actually went backwards. Um, and this is regarded um, by most historians as a classic example of really, really stupid decision-taking in history. Well, that stupid decision-taking allowed the Japanese to learn again about the problems of their trees and forests. They reforested Japan hugely successfully, so it's actually the most heavily forested industrial country in the world today. 
They find ways to live and eat and fish sustainably. They maintained a highly successful population that grew faster than Western European populations. They managed to avoid the plagues um, that were being spread by the merchantmen and the armies around the rest of the world. And they developed, during that period of time, the quintessentially Japanese architecture, that intensely Japanese sense of themselves that they still have today. I mean, you may regard this as a bad thing or a good thing, but it was a very interesting example of a country deciding to go in a different direction. And I think one of the most important things that we can learn from history today is that we can give ourselves the sense of confidence to challenge groupthink. Almost everything that is said unassailably as an obvious truth today um, has been regarded as idiocy or heresy by some important group of people in history. Um, it is a terrible um, tendency that we all have to think that there's only one way forward. It seems to me that we are on the edge of some really, really huge decisions in this country and in other Western countries. Um, in, uh, we have an unsustainable economy. We all know that. We are grotesquely overborrowed, we know that. We have had a democracy which for 20 or 30 years has depended on politicians saying to us, vote for me and you'll have a better life materially next year and the year after that. And that game is pretty much over uh, for reasons I suspect most of you understand. A sense of history allows you to have the confidence, as I say, to think there are other ways forward. If there's one arc through the stories of the history of world that I have been struck by um, and, and written about quite substantially in the book and is there all the time ticking under the surface um, of the, the stick on beards um, and, and the guys with spears on the television uh, series, it's this, that there is a tragic, potentially tragic mismatch between two things, our technical and our scientific ability, our ability to comprehend the world so that we can even comprehend our own consciousness and start to talk about the origins of time um, and the possibility of more than one Big Bang and all the rest that we understand, we get to understand DNA. Mismatch between that, which is a story of astonishing acceleration. It's the reason that there are seven billion of us alive on the planet today. Um, and on the other side, our ability to control and govern ourselves, govern our anger, govern our appetites, govern our sense of fairness, think about the generations ahead who haven't yet been born. What we might call politics has advanced surprisingly and worryingly little. Imagine what kind of world we'd live in today if our politics had advanced from, say, classical times at the same rate as our understanding of biology or genetics. Um, and yet, I think if we were able to take, I don't know, a peasant um, from the time of, of Christ in Galilee and try to explain to that person um, how our mobile phone worked, it would be literally impossible. You know, you would have to talk about plastics, you would have to talk about microelectronics, you'd have to talk about satellites, you would have to describe hundreds and hundreds of years of invention and changed ways of seeing the world. It would be literally impossible. This would simply seem like magic. On the other hand, if you wanted to explain to that same person about Assad and what he was doing to hold on to power, or about corrupt politicians in the West, or about the dirty deals between rich merchants and politicians, I think the peasant would get it immediately. <laughs> Almost no advance at all. The mismatch between our technical brilliance um, exp expanding and accelerating all the time and the very poor um, improvement in the way we do politics, that is the gap in which we will survive or fail over the next two generations. I've got about a minute left, have I? About a minute left. I have been haunted by something that Martin Rees, the former astronomer royal, said. Our scientific ability is now so great that within perhaps 50 years, we will be able to seed life on other planets, either in this solar system or even beyond that. We are technically approaching the possibility of being able to do that. And if that's true, then the story of human life on this planet initially on this planet, could just be beginning. This could be early on in the story. On the other hand, given our overpopulation, 
uh, our water problems, what we've done to the climate and proliferation of nuclear weapons, it's equally possible, possibly more possible, that within the next 50 years or so, we will wipe out human life on the planet. So it could be about to begin or it could be about to end. And the people who will be going through the rapids of that choice are the next two generations, many of whom are already alive. And I would say to you that a sense of history, not just of local history, not just of your own country, but of world history, is an utterly essential component if those people are going to think wisely and make the choices that allow them to get through the rapids. Thank you very much. Thank you.